Are you there, Hello. Zafro? Hello, Phil. How are you? <laughs> Very good. Uh, do they box in Pan- Pakistan? Oh, yeah, of course. I used to do that when I was at school. Oh. I was at school. Oh. <laughs> now, oh, now we've got some. All you biographers, get busy. We're starting. You know, to, I, I'm starting to understand you better. Uh, you know, I, I was um, a very lightweight, mm. so I always used to box uh, three or four weights above my own weight. Ooh. So, as they say, I used to punch above my weight. But uh, you know, I had well, a record. That, was that to improve your skills? Absolutely, I had a, a, a record that. Um, not only that I never lost a match Whoa. or a bout, but that uh, all of my opponents, I always knocked them in the second round. You stopped them? I knocked them flat in the you second round. You knocked them out? Out. Knocked them out in the second round, yes. Did yes. you... Was there one fight or five fights? Or <laughs> yeah. Uh, the... Um, well, I did. That's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, there's you, wouldn't, you wouldn't think I can do that now, you see. <laughs> I, I don't know about you, but I th- you know it is good for a person. I, 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 you probably then took a little bit of interest in these uh, fighters. I, I, I just say it is good for your morale because I turned to the gentleman next to me, uh, Tom Powers. Uh, he's a great uh, supporter of the Cuba and was watching. And I, and I said, that's it. I'm going back to the gym. Because <laughs> I used to be a sparring partner for guys who knocked people out. Right. And um, the understanding was that I would spar so long as he didn't knock me out. Yes. <laughs> and I, I learned enough to stay out of it. Yes. Uh, yes. Well, anyway, that's very refreshing to learn that. Now, we're speaking to Zafar Bengash. It's crescent-online.net. And we, there are a number of issues we would like to ask your uh, guidance on to understand what's unfolding here. Uh, I, we just were speaking to Stephen Gowans, if we could start with Syria. Turkey and, and the United States are meeting, and I guess it's also a NATO meeting of some type. Yes. And they seem to be talking about uh, no-fly zones with the agreement to not call it a no-fly zone, and it involves, of course, overflights of Syrian sovereign airspace in violation of their border. Uh, what is, what is your analysis of what these meetings are about and what they're going to lead to? Yeah, well, this was reported on Friday on the, uh, by the Turkish newspaper Miliyat, uh, which, uh, sorry, Hurriyat, which said that um, Turkey had uh, imposed uh, a no-fly zone or created a, a buffer zone uh, where they said um, it would be uh, a no-fly zone for uh, Syrian aircraft. <clears throat> it's 90 miles long and uh, 50 miles wide into Syrian territory. Mm-hmm. And uh, what the Turkish government uh, also said was, and this is confirmed by Turkish officials, that um, they have provided um, landing and takeoff facilities for U.S. aircraft at their Injerlik uh, air base, which is close to the Syrian border. Mm-hmm. Now, <clears throat> the, the ostensible reason that the Turks advanced was that they uh, were going to um, target uh, ISIS or ISIL or Daesh or whatever different names these uh, terrorist groups have because um, a few days uh, earlier uh, there was a bombing attack in one of the Turkish towns where uh, 30 people were killed. So Turkey announced that it was going to uh, impose that no-fly zone on Syria Mm. Uh, incidentally, without uh, the permission of the Syrian government, without right. even notifying the Syrian government, they just did it unilaterally. Mm. And uh, they are saying that they are going to go after uh, these uh, terrorist groups, but uh, information from Turkey says that uh, the Turkish government is essentially targeting Kurds because the Kurds in Syria have been... Uh, granted, because of the circumstances, considerable degree of autonomy. Mm-hmm. And they are, of course, the, the Kurds in Syria are now uh, coordinating and cooperating with the Kurds on the Turkish side, particularly the PKK, uh, the mm-hmm. Kurdistan Workers' Party. And that's something that the Turkish government uh, will not tolerate. So essentially, uh, the, the U.S. Uh, uh, Turkish strategy is twofold. For Turkey, it is to target the Kurds, and for both of them, for Turkey as well as the U.S., this is 
uh, essentially a plan to begin to get involved directly and militarily in Syria uh, mm-hmm. in order to undermine the government of uh, Bashar al-Assad. Mm-hmm. Because so far, they have been using these proxy forces that they have trained in Jordan, in uh, Turkey. In fact, they've also the U.S. has just signed an agreement with Turkey saying that they're going to train 15,000 uh, Syrian fighters over the next three years, and they're going to send them uh, into Syria. And they're claiming that these are moderate rebels as yeah. opposed to the extremists. But, you know, this is quite mad, this talk. Where is any legal sanction for any of this? None. Uh, what about the United Nations, the Security Council? Um, you know, when they they went into Libya, they were, remember the no-fly zone, which was just going to prevent the killing of innocent civilians by Gaddafi. They ended up bombing everybody. Yes. Uh, and uh, that on that, the... Russians and I, perhaps the Chinese, I guess. I, I think maybe, yeah, they, they went along. Now, obviously, we've come to the point they are not going to go along. Correct. But what happens when they don't go for permission? Well, that's, that's what it is, that um, uh, there is no uh, reference to uh, the UN Security Council, not even a hint that they are going to go there. Uh, this is totally illegal, uh, and uh, it's, it's a violation of a sovereign state uh, territorial integrity. Uh, it's a violation of international law. It's essentially uh, aggression against uh, another state. Uh, but because the U.S. Uh, is militarily powerful, so it imposes uh, mm-hmm. its um, uh, will on other people, other countries, and it can uh, you know, continue to indulge in this kind of conduct uh, when it is totally contrary to international law. And you, of course, mentioned quite rightly the situation in Libya back in 2011 when the no-fly zone was imposed through UN Security Council Resolution 1973. Far from being a no-fly zone uh, uh, imposition because uh, the the Libyan government had immediately accepted that resolution and they said that we are not going to fly our aircraft. They were not bombing their own civilians in any case. Mm -hmm. But that resolution was then used as a pretext to bomb virtually everything. So uh, under that pretext, they had bombed schools, hospitals, farms, people's homes. Uh, In fact, Libyans that have escaped from Libya have said that in those bombing attacks uh, until uh, Gaddafi's uh, overthrow and lynching uh, on October the 20th of 2011, some 80,000 Libyans were killed. And these are not Libyan soldiers. These were primarily Libyan civilians. Mm -hmm. And today, Libya as a state has virtually been destroyed. Uh, The people that they unleashed, the people that they said were their so-called moderate rebels or, or, you know, opposition linked uh, or supported by the U.S., these are armed gangsters and thugs that are terrorizing the Libyan population. Mm-hmm. They've, they've established uh, various fiefdoms in Libya. Uh, Libya is, for all practical purposes, um, not a unitary state at all. Mm-hmm. It is completely divided. It's completely destroyed. And uh, a lot of the weapons from Libya that were looted from Libyan armories have found their way into Syria. Mm-hmm. And a lot of those terrorists have also made their way into Syria, again, courtesy of the Turkish government. And so we see that while uh, Libya was destroyed, uh, a similar uh, operation is underway in uh, Syria now. Yeah, and and that, from the point of view, what you just described, this horrendous situation, is actually an acceptable outcome, despite all the language that they used and the pretext. They really don't mind that they've created absolute chaos and mess. Uh, isn't this, a, frankly, a neo-colonial project? I mean, oh, oh absolutely. I, I think it, this they, is they eventually assume they're going to set up something in these areas which will be under their governance. That's correct, yes. In fact, um, I'm sure um, uh, some, if not all, of your listeners would have uh, read that piece by Colonel Rolf Peters back in uh, 2006 in the uh, American Soldier magazine in which he talked about blood borders. And, and he actually uh, stipulated, said that 
there are many borders uh, in the Middle East region where uh, ethnic groups have been corralled into nation states, and it it is uh, in the U.S.'s interest to uh, redraw these borders along ethnic lines. So essentially, uh, states like Iraq and Syria, etc., uh, and Libya is already under underway. That that's already happened there. Uh, that they would redraw these borders, and and if they do that, and and the game, the dirty game that unfortunately Turkey is playing, mm-hmm. that uh, Turkey will not uh, escape uh, unscathed either, because there's a large uh, Kurdish population in Turkey as well. Mm-hmm. So if it is digging a grave for Syria, uh, the 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 Turkish uh, government and state uh, is likely to fall into that hole itself because there are Kurds in Turkey as well. It's a really uncomfortable uh, sight to to, uh, watch. This is Zavar Bengash. It's uh, crescent-online.net. And just on lastly on that point about Syria, there have, it's, uh, we uh, were speaking earlier about the speech, a really important one in my view, by President Assad, where he laid out uh, what they are doing and why they're doing it. Um, if, if some are, make, of course, the Western press says he's acknowledging he has trouble getting sufficient recruits and all that. But uh, it did seem uh, he put his cards on the table. He said Hezbollah is our ally. We really owe them a lot. They have a right to be part of our struggle, and they're there. He, he thanked uh, the Islamic Republic. Uh, he thanked China, Russia for their position. Um, and I've, it's always a back and forth thing about the war, but they have made progress. So this is going to be an interesting kind of confrontation as Turkey takes uh, increases the pressure. Yes, of course. Is uh, there a I, danger of straight fight between the Syrians and the Turks? Turkey. I should uh, say. Well, uh, the, the the Syrian army is not uh, in that region because the Syrian army is a little further away. So. Uh, and, and from my uh, understanding of the situation and what I've been following, that um, uh, the Turkish military is not very keen on this. In fact, when uh, President Erdogan, and this is another interesting point that I think your listeners should uh, take note of, that uh, according to the Turkish constitution, uh, it's the prime minister of Turkey that must make these decisions uh, not the president. The president is supposed to be a figurehead president, and yet it is uh, President Erdogan who keeps on issuing out orders to the military and keeps on interfering in the mm-hmm. day-to-day running of uh, the, the state affairs. And Erdogan issued an order to the military uh, that they should uh, start making preparations for operations uh, in Syria. So the military Mm -hmm. top brass turned around and said, we need this in writing. Mm -hmm. Uh, We are not going to carry out any operation until we have written uh, authorization for this. So the -hmm. Turkish prime minister then, uh, Ahmed Daudoglu, then issued that directive. But the Turkish ground forces have not acted upon it yet. They are Mm -hmm. not happy with the way this policy is being implemented or pursued. They don't want to get involved. They realize Mm -hmm. it has serious repercussions for the Turkish state, and they would rather keep out of it. But it seems, unfortunately, that Erdogan is uh, just absolutely determined uh, to to mess up the whole situation. And of course, at this time, he's also very cynically manipulating the situation in order to pave the way for a snap election in Turkey again, because in the last election on June the 7th, the ruling party, the AKP, was uh, considerably yeah, degraded. Reduced. <clears throat> That's correct. It lost its majority. Well, wait, wouldn't they be rolling the dice to call an early election? That is correct. That is that is some some. Uh, they the, could the be party. more reduced if they. <laughs> yes. If they make the wrong step. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, this is uh, obviously uh, Erdogan is is uh, taking a big gamble, and and some of the political parties, in fact, the people of Turkey are are very upset with him, and that's why they they withdrew their support from the AKP that had ruled Turkey since 2002. Mm-hmm. And so he doesn't want to get into an alliance with any uh, any other party. That's the only way that he can rule. 
and uh, the, the the parties that that are willing to enter into a coalition have clearly demanded that Turkey must reverse its Syria policy. Wow. And, of course, uh, you know, Erdogan doesn't want to do that, and so he's... Uh, so this, uh, by the way, that would mean that this decision about opening that base to the Americans would raise some specters, right? Because they refused to open the bases for the attack on Iraq. That is correct, yes. And their Turkish, Turkey, Turks took pride in that, that they weren't getting their hands dirty in that. Yes, that is correct, yes. Yes. So I wouldn't mind, if, I wouldn't want to run for your election on letting the Americans <laughs> use an <laughs> airbase. You know, I yes, assume patriotism exists in that country. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, now I have to take you to Yemen because obvious there's a link here. The Turkish military, uh, you say, is is uh, very reluctant about the to get involved with Syria. Uh, Pakistan's military was reluctant to get involved in Yemen. Yes. And is that still true? And is and is it are the Turks getting involved in Yemen? No, the Turks are not getting involved in Yemen. Um, in fact, uh, even the the uh, other uh, coalition partners uh, with uh, the Saudis uh, are only there sort of nominally. They're not really uh, involved in any significant way, uh, and and they've realized, you know, after uh, three four months of uh, bombing Yemen, that all they have achieved is killing a lot of civilians, but they have not achieved any of their political or military objectives. Mm-hmm. In fact, uh, what has happened is that uh, the Yemenis uh, have carried out a number of uh, attacks on Saudi military bases in uh, southern Saudi Arabia, particularly. We, and we haven't heard of this kind of <clears throat> phenomenon in a long time, that, that, the, that the Saudis take a blow. Yes, there are, in fact, uh, a number of military bases in Jizan province, which incidentally, it, it actually belonged to Yemen, and it was uh, that region was illegally occupied by the Saudis in 1934. And uh, about three weeks ago, there was, uh, three or four weeks ago, there was a uh, particularly, um, uh, you know, a significant um, uh, development in the sense that one of the military bases uh, was uh, being visited by the Saudi Air Force chief. And the Yemenis uh, somehow got wind of that, and they fired a missile at the base, and the Saudi military chief was killed in that missile attack. Oh. The Saudis actually announced that, no, no, he hadn't died in that uh, at that military it's, base. It's he had pneumonia. Uh, he, uh, <laughs> they said he had gone abroad and he had had a heart attack. Uh, um, <laughs> he might have had a heart attack when the shell went off. That's probably that's possible. what happened. But those those people actually, the, the eyewitnesses who saw his body, they mm. said that his uh, body was charred black, and obviously yeah. heart attacks don't turn bodies charred yeah, black. that's right. That's not a so, symptom. You're right. Exactly. So, and, and about 60 or 70 other Saudi soldiers were also killed. Ooh. In fact, there, there is a... No, that uh, is a, quite a turn. Absolutely. And there is, in fact, in, in that region, there is a, a new group that has emerged. It, they call themselves the Jizan Liberation Army or something along that name. Mm. <clears throat> and they have said and they have vowed that we want to liberate this land that the Saudis illegally occupied in 1934. Because that's the, in, in, the, in the, uh, the kingdom, that's the one of the least developed areas in addition to the eastern province this is one of the least developed areas in uh, the kingdom and so the people are very unhappy uh, they don't want to be part of the the saudi kingdom uh, and and that definitely is going to cause uh, a lot of problems for the saudi regime and the ruling family because uh, the the situation obviously has not turned out the way they had planned in the sense that if they attack Yemen, that the Yemeni people will, will uh, mm-hmm. buckle under, they will surrender in a few days. They are bombed and bombed and bombed. In fact, uh, last Friday, uh, they, they bombed uh, a town in uh, Thais province in, in Yemen, and they killed 120 civilians. Mm-hmm. This was the largest uh, civilian casualties uh, in one single strike in the whole war that the Saudis have waged on Yemen. And this is obviously uh, heightened anger against the Saudis. I mean, the people in Yemen are absolutely seething with anger. And mm-hmm. they're not going to let uh, these kinds of attacks go unpunished. So I think if the Saudis continue, of course, the next day the Saudis announced that they're going to uh, declare a ceasefire for five days, but no yeah. ceasefire has been 
uh, you know, observed. In fact, previous ceasefires have also not been observed. These were just uh, ruses it's, that it's were rhetoric. used. Yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely, yes. Um, well, and in fact, the UN has said that uh, you know the the Saudis have caused not only a lot of instru- infrastructure damage; they've killed a lot of civilians, thousands of them. But out of uh, 23 million Yemeni population, 12 million are food deficient. Uh, and another 16 million do not have access to clean drinking water. So it's like uh, a siege, right? They're, just, they're literally trying to punish uh, the uh, civilian population to make us create a surrender. That is correct, yes. That's what yeah. they're doing, unfortunately. Yeah. But your reading is that they actually prefer to be Yemenis and probably won't. They will, they will not surrender. And, fact, and they have some offensive capacity. Absolutely, they do. They do. In fact... Uh-huh. You see, they, uh, one of the things is that there are some people that you just don't mess with, and Yemenis are one of them. Ah. Uh, they just don't, don't neither forgive nor forget. And, well, and that so, sounds attractive. Uh, the, um, this is round one. Maybe they'll knock them out in the second round. <laughs> I heard that somewhere. Uh, <laughs> they do Absolutely. know how to fight, and they, 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 they don't spend the, all their winters in the Riviera or whatever it is. That's uh, <laughs> the, this is Zafar Bengash. The site is crescent-online.net. Now, the, we have this agreement, and everyone's staring at it and trying to understand uh, the, the negotiated agreement, the uh, Iran and the what is called the 5 plus 1. Yes. And they have asked the Iranians uh, to abandon uh, their nuclear work, uh, which, of course, was initiated by a famous individual, the Shah, and right. the Americans didn't mind the Shah doing it. But anyway, could you tell us, what sure. is, give us an analysis of this, and it's kind of the, the ripple from it in, uh, in your view. Sure. As far as uh, Iran's position is concerned, they have not abandoned their nuclear program at all. What they have done is that they have limited their nuclear program. In fact, they have agreed to limit enrichment to 3.67%. And they've always said that they were not making the bomb. They had no intention of making the bomb. In fact, there is a fatwa of uh, the Iranian leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, who says that nuclear weapons are forbidden in Islam because these are weapons Mm -hmm. of mass destruction. And Mm -hmm. in order to so it's basically an unnecessary crisis. I think you wrote that, did you not? And, and others have been saying it. This yes. is almost a phony issue. Absolutely. They're not trying to make a bomb. Exactly. Absolutely. And Iran has repeatedly said that. And in fact, they have said that, okay, in order to uh, prove to you that we are not after the bomb, we are prepared to limit our enrichment to 3.67%, but we are not going to stop our uh, enrichment. That is our inherent right under the NPT. Uh, the, the Americans had uh, demanded that they should um, stop all of the centrifuges. They had about 19,000, 20,000 of them. <clears throat> Iran will continue to spin 6,000 of centrifuges. They'll continue to enrich uranium. So they have not abandoned that at all. And um, what has happened, in, in fact, is that uh, repeatedly, and the, the John Kerry has said this repeatedly, uh, Obama has said this, that uh, sanctions did not work. Uh, Iran continued to make progress. Those people that have visited Iran in in recent years or frequently, they would they would uh, confirm that uh, when you arrive in in Tehran, it is a booming city. There, I mean, there are you know construction cranes everywhere, construct uh, building mm-hmm. buildings, massive buildings are going up everywhere. There are massive highways being built everywhere. There are trains running around all over. You mm-hmm. simply you go to the shopping areas and there are you know. The places are flooded with people. I mean, you know, there is just, I mean, you, it just isn't a country under siege or under sanctions. I mean, what the Iranians have done is absolutely remarkable that they have uh, weathered all of this. In fact, they have essentially turned inwards and rebuilt things on their own or built things on their own. They have simply not buckled under. And that's something that the Americans have realized. And mm-hmm. also that. And they knew have a, a new situation with apropos of Russia, yes. that keeping this up uh, was going to isolate the United States. Exactly, exactly. In fact, Kerry said so as much. He said that if we didn't enter into this agreement, the sanctions were not working, and other countries would simply just ignore us, and we would lose all credibility, so we might as well enter into this agreement. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think the most significant aspect of this agreement is 
to my mind, regardless of the, the, the nuclear issue, which, has, as you said and we discussed, it's a completely phony issue, and that is that Iran's standing as the uh, regional power has now been recognized by the United States itself. Mm-hmm. After trying for 35 years to, to bring down the government in Iran or the system in Iran, the U.S. has not only failed, but it has failed miserably, and finally it has come to the conclusion that they cannot do it, they have to work with Iran, because so many other problems have emerged in the region. And the U.S. has absolutely no capacity whatsoever to take on Iran militarily. I mean, sure, the U.S. can cause a lot of damage, but mm-hmm. there is going to be massive blowback from, from that, uh, any such uh, misadventure. And therefore, the U.S. has decided quite rightly that it is best to uh, yeah. work with Iran because, you know, there are crises like ISIS, there are uh, developments taking place in Iraq and Afghanistan and so on. And without, without Iran's help, they cannot solve any of these problems. So Iran's uh, primacy in the region has been recognized, of course, much to the chagrin of um, Saudi Arabia and Israel, but, uh, yes. you know. Who, those, who really spoke with almost one voice. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> yes. yes. It's going to be, now they have to make up their minds uh, how they're going to adjust to survive this themselves. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, Zafar Bengash, it's great talking to you. Uh, well, my pleasure. Uh, crescent-online.net. And I'm glad to hear about your boxing career. We're going to have.